a little bit about that in just a minute. So, for the introduction, uh, what is analog to digital conversion, right? So, big wall of text, that's what I wanted everybody to see. Analog to digital converter is a device that converts the continuous digital quantity to a digital number that represents the quantity's amplitude. We also introduce quantization as an example. Error and some other things like that, it will be 
generally in terms of the least significant bit. So when we cut each half in half and we get like a square, you know, now we have a few more steps in our square wave. It looks a little closer. You can see like the large areas uh, up in the very corners have been cut down quite a bit, so our, we've reduced our error, right? So if once is good, then more must be better, right? So I'm not going to do this one at a time and keep adding bits and bits and bits and bits, but let's just go ahead and say, let's cut it in half 10 times. So what would that look like? At this resolution, you can't tell the difference between the two right. pairs. So when we say we cut it in half 10 times, that means we've cut it in 2 to the 10, 2 to the 10 parts, which is 1,024 parts. So there's actually 1,024 little steps up there, and we can represent this with a 10-bit digital number. So it'll be a 1 and a 0, string, 10, 1. So if you actually want to see what the quantization error looks like on this thing, we have to zoom in like a whole, whole lot. And in this case, we actually have to zoom in like a hundred times to see the difference between those two, right? So when we when we add additional bits, we end up reducing our quantization error. That's like the so so basically you always want to increase the number of bits that you're using for measurements within some like cost bounds, like more bits on an ABC cost more money. Sometimes it can be slower and those sort of things, but small small matter. Basically. The, the takeaway from this is that you know you want more bits to get a more accurate representation of what you're doing, right? So uh, to to go through sort of like the more general process when we're like doing this, we have to decide uh, what we're going to map our minimum and maximum to. Because in this example, I just sort of went from the bottom of the curve to the top of the curve, but that doesn't always happen, and sometimes we have to uh, we have to work. Uh, on like where we fall in that range. And then we have to decide, you know, how many bits we're going to use, how many times we're going to cut this in half, that sort of thing. And uh, then we basically cut each half in half, uh, and we compare, you know, as we did in the first one, we said the top half is one, the bottom half is zero. Then we look in that half, and we say in that half, the top half of that is one, the bottom half of that is zero. In each half, we repeat that process over and over and over. Again. So, because I'm bad at explaining things, I threw in an example. We it's are going to the, the light bulb that almost flew. What? Uh, it's going to be like the light bulb that almost flew. No, 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 no. Uh, not not as exciting or as dangerous or as likely to cut off my fingers as that one from an earlier class we were teaching. So, what we are going to do is. Uh, we are going to say we are going to do an analog digital conversion and our analog in this case is going to be numbers from 0 to 100. That's going to be our range. So we're going to call uh, the bottom 0 will map to 0 and the top will map to whatever our maximum is. Well the next step is we've got to figure out how many bits. right? So in this case we're going to pick 3 bits because that's going to be 2 to the third pieces. It means we're going to cut an 8 and I'm assuming that everybody here will be good at, you know, halves and halves and halves. So, uh, and then we're going to pick a sample, and I randomly picked 67 as an example. So in this case, we are going to do the analog conversion of 67 into 3-bit binary over this 100-point range, kind of arbitrary. It's not exactly the same thing as converting 67 to binary, but it works in a similar fashion. So. In this case, uh, we'll go back over the range. Anybody remember what range we picked? Mm -hmm. 0 to 100. Absolutely. So, uh, we cut it in half. What's in the middle? 50, right? Excellent. So, we compare our sample, 67, to 50. Is that higher or low? Is the sample higher or lower than our comparison? High, right? So, high equals 1. Or our most significant bit in this case is 1. Then, we have a new range, right? So we've cut it in half. So our new range is now going to be 50 to 100, right? And half of that is, the middle is 75. So we compare our sample again. Okay, our sample is 67. Our new comparison point is 75, higher low. In this case, low. So that means the second bit is zero. 
right? Now, we repeat the process one more time. What's the last range? Trick question. It's not really a trick question. Uh, our, uh, it's 50 to 75. Because like that, that was, so in the last case, our halves were 50 to 75 and 75 to 100. We picked the bottom range, so our last range is 50 to 75. In the middle is 62.5, same figure eights. Fancy. So we compare our sample, 67 to 62.5. High or low? High. High. So that basically means that whenever we converted this sample to binary over this range, it maps out to 101. That is basically what an analog to digital converter is going to do. It's going to take your range, it's going to take a sample, it's going to go in the middle and say high or low, then go to the middle of that range, high or low, go to the middle of that range, high or low, and keep going for the number of bits that you have. So, but to come back to our earlier point of quantization error, basically every number between 63 and 74 will all map to 101 in this range. So that's where you, you know, you. We talk about resolution and more bits will add more resolution. Congratulations. We have passed the first part of this class. You are now all three bit analog to digital converters. Uh, we can get you part numbers assigned after this and we'll make data sheets to put in the mouser. Uh, shipping will be a problem. <laughs> there, there is a caveat here. You're really only a three bit A to Z, A, D, C for the specific inputs of 0 to 100. But hey, it's better than it was before. Right? So, uh, if I were Isaac, there would be a really cool picture here. Uh, that was basically the end of that slide, and that's all nice. <laughs> so, so ABC. You had to do a class on how to do presentations. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> so, ABC, it's that easy, right? Right? Well, that's yeah. the question everybody's asking. I'm, I'm certified. Well, you know, not exactly. There, there are some other problems that we have to, to concern ourselves with. We arbitrarily picked 0 to 100 as our range, and whenever you're actually doing this with circuits, uh, your analog to digital converter is usually going to be from zero volts to some upper volts, and that's not always going to be the number that you want it to be. So you're always going to have to, to play around in there. So in our example, we did zero to 100, and we saw how everything from 63 to 74 resolved to one number. But if I was really interested in measuring numbers that only fall between, let's say, zero and 10, those would all resolve to zero in our analog digital converter case. So you have resolution problems where I need to measure finer things. And so, so we have to worry about that as a real concern. Hey, I got ahead of myself. Resolution is the problem. Uh, speed is actually another issue. So you notice it took us, uh, we had to make a few steps where we took our sample, we found our half, and we compared. And we took our sample, and we found our half, and compared. Uh, I'm mostly, in, in terms of like temperature measurement, I'm going to be talking about things that are very slow, right? So, so basically things that can be considered DC signals. But if you are trying to measure something that moves very, very quickly, uh, there are a couple of different types of chips. One will sample and hold, and it will hold that sample, and it will always measure that one sample. And some do uh, sequential measurement. So it will say, I'll go get a sample and compare high or low, and then move to the next half, and then go get another sample, which if everything's moving slow, that'll be the same sample, but if things are moving very quickly, that may not be. So you may have to worry about speed in there where it's going to try to, like it's going to be chasing the moving target. Uh, that's, that's like, I'm getting down to the level of I want to specify a specific ABC for this project and that sort of stuff. But, and we'll talk a little later about how this works uh, specifically. Uh, and then there are like the usual problems that you have with any sort of analog circuitry. Uh, gain will be a problem. So you can have like offset error, gain errors, where uh, the ideal case uh, is like the red line here. You basically have, if I double my, uh, if I double my input, I double my output. A nice, smooth, linear relationship. But uh, in some cases, like if you 
double your input, your output may more than double, so your sensor or your ADC will lie to you about what sort of input you're seeing. Um, I'm sorry, I was going to ask you to go back to the side. So DC at the bottom, does that stand for digital code, or is that some other? Uh, digital uh, direct current. Sorry. Oh, like DC. Okay. Yes, okay. yes. Uh, that, that's what I was saying. Like if you're, uh, I'm not really talking about like signal processing. That's kind of like a whole separate thing where you want to measure like really fast AC signals and all this kind of stuff. Uh, it, it, it gets very complicated. Bandwidth <coughs> problems, Nyquist frequency, all sorts of crazy stuff that nobody understands, I think. But. <laughs> Uh, uh, but least of all, not me. So uh, well, that's why I'm saying, like, in this case, I'm talking about something like a temperature sensor. Um, but I'm talking specifically about a temperature sensor. This information does not relate specifically to that. If you're taking any sort of measurement, that moves nice and slow. If you have, like, a, a light sensor, if you want to measure the light levels in here, or I don't know. Does anybody have like a specific sensor application? You know, like, hey, how does that work or something? It might be really useful to know how many people are in space. <laughs> uh, you could, uh, yeah, tricky question, you could actually get a CO2 measuring sensor and we could put together, like based on people's, I'm an HVAC guy, so I can actually put together that and we could very quickly relate our ventilation rate to the number of people in here. Is there a cost to help with CO2 per person? Like, would you and I have the same CO2? Um, reasonably. I think that's the silo right? Oh, right. Sorry? Oh, I wasn't supposed to tell you. Oh, yeah, yeah. I don't, I'm pretty sure there's not too many out there like me, so. Uh, sorry. Was there more questions about that? Feel, feel free to stop me at any time. I've got a lot of... What's causing the game? I may have missed. Is it magic? Over... Uh, you know, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's that, that circuitry stuff that I don't really understand too much as those mechanical engineers. There are there are circuits inside these analog digital converters, um, and they do things. And uh, I don't know. So anybody an electrical engineer can help me out with that. Uh, it's a it's a complicated system of levers and pulleys. That's about as much. Oh, okay. As well. And the monkeys just. Get over there. Yeah. Uh, okay. No, I understand. Thank you. Uh, there, there's probably something in here about op amps. I mean, I took, I, I had to take circuits for dummies in college, and I, there was a section on op amps, and you know. Uh, so, so there should be a good point for you. You really don't have to know that much about circuitry to be able to do this stuff, right? Um, beyond gain issues, we have linearity problems. So here's another great example. Our ideal. Uh, our ideal analog to digital converter should be a nice, even stair step, right? If we move over a little bit on our sample, we move a little bit on our output. We move a lot on our sample, we move a lot on our output. Uh, real circuits never behave like they're supposed to, which is part of the reason that I hate circuits. Uh, in, in this case, it's showing you, you know, sometimes we'll move over just a little bit, and we'll get a lot of output. Sometimes we'll move over a little bit and get no output. In this case, you can see uh, on the bottom we have voltage. So every step is 250 millivolts. And we're digitizing that uh, three bits, exactly like we did in our example. So every time we go over 250 millivolts, we increment up one. And you can see in this case, because there's a linearity problem, code 100 never shows up. It basically skips right over it because of like it's traveling too much in some of the previous steps. Uh, the, those are those are some of the, the real errors that you run into whenever you're looking at some of the rule of stuff here. Uh, differential nonlinearity because it's not constant throughout the thing. So every step is like if you're if you're looking at the small text. It's 1.2 least significant bits required to get it to move up to the next step, and then it's one least significant bit to get it up to the next step, and then it's 1.3 least. So you, you have some sort of like nonlinear output there, where the ideal case is one least significant bit, one increment. That's what you would want in the ideal case. <coughs> uh, and then there's that fuzzy noise problem, right? So our ideal stair step is what we see on the left. 
but in the actual case, you always have noise in there, both on your input and on your output, and things get a little blurry. And uh, there, you you can, if you take a measurements class, you can really dig into the fact that how air stacks up on you and where noise gets introduced and all that sort of stuff, and basically tells you that you can never trust any measurement ever. Not very useful. So. In, in my case, you know, measure twice, cut once, good enough, right? And you can turn all the anti-aliasing over. Yeah. Well, uh, now what, right? So we've got all these things that we have to worry about. So uh, we have to sort of like talk about those in context of a specific chip, because that's really like you're going to deal with those issues on a chip by chip basis, right? So, does anyone have a particular chip in mind? The AC Mega thing. Oh, oh yeah. That one. <laughs> this is uh, the only picture we're going to have in the presentation. That's a really great picture, though. <laughs> uh, but in this case, we are going to talk very specifically about these analog input pins and what sort of magic that they do, right? Um, and uh, you can go look for analog uh, input examples on Arduino, and they're kind of, in my opinion, not helpful. Uh, but there is a place where you can get like all the information that you need. Uh, what we're going to talk about most immediately is if you notice, uh, those pins uh, are basically lined up with, those six analog input pins are basically lined up with the six pins closest to it on the Atmel, uh, at Mega microcontroller in the middle. If you remember from uh, Isaac's presentation, the other picture that we have that I stole most uh, directly from him, uh, if you look, those six pins on the upper right in this image are the six pins that are closest to those analog inputs. And if you actually look at the hardware, the board itself, basically this is just connected two pins, which means all of the other electronics and all of the other stuff on the Arduino does not have any effect or input whatsoever on these analog inputs. That means you can basically go look at the data sheets directly. And yeah, now back to the ugly part, because I'm out of pictures. <laughs> uh, the DMCA address. Yeah, you know. Uh, the, the Arduino is based on the Atmel at Mega microprocessors. And the cool part is that the analog fans are connected directly to the microcontroller. So we can go to the data sheet itself if we want more information about how the analog to digital conversion works. Because the Arduino website is is like Arduino is fantastic because you can get into them and do things that you don't understand in the least. But whenever it doesn't work and you need to understand what's going on, that that in my opinion is kind of where like the Arduino help stuff isn't as useful. What 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 this means is that you can go to like. Uh, and, and the data sheet for this microprocessor is like 400 pages long, and it, I promise you it has more information than you ever wanted to know about it in there. Um, Arduino is still good for telling us about the software and how to interact with it and stuff, but when we want to know about the hardware, the data sheet's uh, where it's at. And so, in this case, I hope you're asking, okay, exciting, what does the hardware do? Uh, I hope you're saying to yourself, man, I really hope he doesn't show us that data sheet, because I'm not. <laughs> uh, we talked a lot about analog to digital conversion and that sort of stuff before, and bits of resolution. Well, the Arduino has a 10-bit uh, analog to digital converter on it, which means it will take whatever number, whatever input that you give it, and break it down into 1,024 steps. Uh, it has one half least significant bit, integral nonlinearity. So when we talked about some of those linearity errors before, and we talked about least significant bits, uh, that tells you basically the magnitude of the error that you will expect in terms of linearity in this case. Uh, whenever you add up all of your other, like your gain error and all those other, when you add them and stack them all up, you get plus or minus two least significant bits of absolute accuracy. Which is not bad. Like two out of 1,024 is is a pretty good estimate. Um, in terms of speed, this thing is good for up to 15,000 samples per second at maximum resolution. Uh, you can get the microcontroller to do some funny stuff where it'll take 
of creating at less than maximum resolution, but you can't do that through the Arduino interface by default. Is that, do you know if that's uh, tied to the positive frequency? Uh, or your yes, uh, I think so. Uh, well, it, it gets a little tricky because there there is a lot of circuitry that goes into the analog to digital conversion process that I haven't really talked about. You know, the, the thing has to go out and read a voltage and you have to, there's like acquisition time where you have to wait for the voltage to catch up and it a capacitor that uses to store the voltage and you have to, it gets a little tricky. So um, sometimes it's clock speed limited and sometimes it's acquisition speed. I think in this case, it, it's, it's related to the, the acquisition speed. You can... Uh, whenever you are doing like fast AC data acquisition, if you're if you're doing like analog digital conversion and that sort of like I'm trying to process radio frequencies and that kind of stuff, that hardware gets kind of expensive. Uh, and in this case, uh, it's going to measure. So we talked about where we had to pick ranges before, and it's you know, we were arbitrarily picking. Well, in this case, it's picked for us. It's going to measure uh, zero bits at zero voltage ground reference voltage and it's going to measure uh, 10 bits 1 1 1 1 1 1 uh, at the uh, voltage supply for the Arduino. Um, we were talking about, yes sir? I'm sorry, what are you doing with the VCC? Uh, next slide. <laughs> uh, so uh, it also has like a sample and hold, so we talked about how some, some measurements will go out and like first bit get a sample, second bit get another sample, third bit get another sample. In this case it has circuitry where it will hold that first measurement and do all its tests, all 10 bits uh, against that one sample. So you don't have to worry about chasing a signal around, but you know if you're trying to measure something that fast, how good is the data? I don't know. If you're trying to do something that fast, you probably need something. Uh, here's a here's a neat trick that doesn't always get covered. You can actually change uh, the so we're talking about how you can use the the reference voltage from the Arduino. You can also apply an external reference, and we'll talk a little bit about that uh, in a second. So uh, your question was okay. Well, it measures the reference voltage on the board. What is it? Well, that's where we have to take the data from the data sheet and take the data from the Arduino and sort of mesh them all together to see what sort of hardware do I have. And if you're doing custom designs and all that kind of stuff, this is the sort of, the sort of thing that you would do, but Arduino has done all of this magic for us. So uh, measurement voltage is uh, from ground to 5 volts, because that's what the Arduino powers itself from. It's got a little voltage regulator circuit. As Isaac pointed out, you can feed it everything from like, like 6 to 20 volts, although it prefers 7 to 12, I think. And it will generate a nice smooth <coughs> five volt input, and that's what you'll be referencing. Um, we do know that it has uh, 10 bit resolution, so what we know now is that the Arduino takes that five volts, divides it into 1024 pieces, and that tells us that every step that the Arduino measures is roughly 4.9 millivolts, 4.88 something something something. So that helps us <coughs> determine that one least significant bit, right, we talked about this concept of like what one step means, it's like the tiniest bit that it can measure, is 4.9 millivolts. If we go back to the accuracy of this thing, now I know that the Arduino measures basically plus or minus 10 millivolts. So that helps inform us when we are trying to determine like what we're measuring, is that enough accuracy for us that we need to dig in a little more. Um, and, and that's and that's kind of uh, the the Arduino point. You can attach any sensor, any signal, any voltage, whatever, and it will give you a digital representation accurate to plus or minus 10 millivolts. So the the next question I think should be, okay, well that's great. I can attach any sensor to read. How how hard is that, right? Well, this is the part where Arduino is like absolutely fantastic. Uh, the Arduino library has all boiled down to one command. And it's as simple as uh, in your code somewhere you put analog read and you tell it which pin number to go look at and it's done. It's that easy, right? 
uh, connect the sensor to the pin, tell it which one to read, and it will return an integer between 0 and 1023 to represent which one of the 1024 steps that you are on. Right? Uh, if you want to convert that back to a voltage, you can go ahead and multiply it by 0 0.0049. You're basically like multiplying it. Uh, you, you can, I mean, if you're using this in programming or you want to do something with it, you can, you know, if you have your data sheet on your sensor, you can go ahead and convert your voltage back into whatever you're measuring so you can use that number directly. That's all a programming problem, really easy to work out. Um, I'm going to give you a quick demo of how easy it is to use the MLO read. Um, I, don't, I never did come up with better method than just sitting down and doing a little alt tab.
smaller resolution. So there's a few tricks that we can pull. Um, we talked a little bit before about this external reference that we can apply. There is a, uh, a, a pin on the Arduino called ARIF, and that stands for analog reference. We can supply it a different voltage, uh, externally set up different voltage. It needs to be less than 5 volts, right? Because it, it doesn't, like the Arduino doesn't really like light too much. Um, and we can supply it with like a, a voltage divider to get basically our voltage down to a lower, lower level. Uh, and we, we have to tell the Arduino that we are going to use an external reference, and there's a function already built in for that. Analog reference external done. It's that simple. You connect up to circuitry, and you have basically a brand new ADC that's measuring at a different, uh, different resolution. So here's sort of an example. I kind of put all this stuff together. My intention is to make these slides available to whoever wants to download them later after the fact. So I put in an example. Um, the only the only thing that, that I do want to to point out is that in this case. Um, V out is going to be what we're connecting to our Arduino, uh, and between V in and V out, R1 is there. We want that to be at least a uh, 5,000 ohm resistor. That way, we never have a case where we're sending too much current to the Arduino. It doesn't really like that. It's, it's fragile. <clears throat> but in this case, uh, if we set up a voltage divider with a 10 kilo ohm and 1 kilo ohm resistor, uh, V out will work out to 0.45 volts down from 5 volts. Uh, which means that if you look at the bottom two lines, we take our 0.45 volts, divide it by uh, 1,024, and now each step, instead of being um, 4.9 millivolts, it's now 0.44 millivolts. So we can get uh, much, much tighter. Uh, each voltage step becomes much, much tighter. We get a lot more resolution over what we're measuring, right? So your question would be, well, why don't we just always do that? Because we always want more accuracy, right? Well, the, the trouble... Uh, the good part is we do have 10 times as much accuracy, so we can see much smaller changes in what's happening. Uh, the bad part about it is that our new maximum voltage for measurement is now 0.45. So if you're trying to measure something over a wide range, it's not as useful to you, right? So what you got in additional resolution, you've lost in range. There's no such thing as a free launch, unfortunately. Uh, the ugly part about it is get out your fretboard, soldering iron, put in a voltage divider, run everything in, make sure nothing fries, etc. It's a lot of work to do that. So uh, that's why we don't really do that all that often. That's why that does remain the uh, infrequently used pin on the Arduino. But you, you know it exists now, and if you have a specific application where you need to do that, it's there, and you can use it for that. Uh, and I'm going to do this just like a Yes, uh, it, it will. Yes, that becomes the reference voltage for all analog measurements on the Arduino. So it's not fun to think about. Good question. So this ends uh, phase two, right? You, we've already talked about all of the uh, all of the stuff related to analog digital conversion. We've talked about all the stuff for Arduino. You know how all those bits fit together. You know how to take measurements of different voltages. All the inputs, resolutions, accuracy. You know what the software spits out, an integer between 0 and 1023. How to use it, multiply it by stuff to get it to voltage, and multiply it by something else to convert to whatever sensor you want. It's pretty easy, right? Any questions about that that whole hardware part aspect of it, the analog digital conversion, any of that stuff? Did you mention the speed at which you can sample again. Yes, uh, there, there's uh, 15,000 samples per second is the maximum in this case, and it, it's it's really kind of a theoretical maximum because that's basically using all of your resources to take samples and not do anything with them. But so this would that down with the five samples. Um, if we go back and look at our example here. Uh, you see there's a delay command right after that. You know, it, it's it's not like the the easiest way. But but you can you can delay by doing whatever else you want to do, right? You can just go about your business and have it only take a sample whenever it needs to.
or uh, it will heat up, which means the resistance will go up, so it'll have a tendency to limit the current that goes through it. Um, alternatively, there are negative temperature coefficients, so as temperature goes up, resistance goes down. Uh, those are the ones that are usually used for temperature measurement, and they make, uh, you can use them for like fuses, right? So if you send too much current through them, they heat up, the resistance goes down, more current goes through them, they'll have a tendency to burn out, right? Um, the one thing that you do have to be careful about when you're using uh, thermistors in any sort of application is exactly what we just talked about. As current goes through them, they heat up, uh, and that will change the reading of what they have. So self-heating is kind of a problem with these things if you're looking for high levels of accuracy or if you're using them at sort of like the limits of their operating ranges, you have to be mindful of that sort of thing. <clears throat> so the question should be, okay, that's a lot of information. How does that all help me? Well, uh, you can set up a simple voltage divider, and you know, we, we looked at a voltage divider before when we were doing our analog input voltage. You can replace one of the you can replace one of the resistors with a thermistor, and now you have an easy way to read the input voltage directly uh, into the um, Arduino, right? So if you actually Google Arduino thermistor, hit enter, uh, it will come up with a, an example on the Arduino playground, and it gives you here. You a thermistor with a 10 kilo ohm resistance at room temperature in series with a 10 kilo ohm resistor. It looks exactly like that. You guys may have done this before. Or looked at this example. <coughs> uh, right? Well, that, that's what you need. That's what you measure temperature every time, every case, everything. Right? Well, you may have some questions like, why did they pick that resistor? Why is 10 k at room temperature? What does that mean? How does, uh, I, don't, I don't know. Why, why did they put a 10K resistor with it? Is that the right one, or should I have used a 5K or a 20K? Yeah. You know, or, or what happens if I have a different resistor or a thermistor? I can't find the one that has a 10 kilo ohm at room temperature or something. So what resistor would I want to put with that, right? So you're gonna have lots of questions about how this works. And if this was like the, the basic intro class, we would ignore all of that stuff, but this is the advanced track of Fly Golly, so we are really digging it. So, uh, the thing that you need to know is that a thermistor is a very, very nonlinear sensor, right? Uh, it's not if you if you double the temperature on it, the resistance is going to change by much more than a factor of two. Um, at some temperatures, you'll get very, very tiny uh, changes in resistance as a function of temperature. At different temperatures, very, very large changes. <coughs> So the question is going to be, well, how do I know? What, what, what's the right temperature to use? What's all that? Uh, once again, I'm going to say, go to the data sheets to find out what part that you were using, right? Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a great example because a lot of times data sheets will give you like a temperature table and you'll say, at this temperature, it's this resistance, at this temperature, it's this resistance. And if you're programming, you can actually just write a little lookup table and have it just go read, you know, the value whatever you want to do. It's pretty easy. Uh, other data sheets will actually give you modeling parameters that sort of describe the behavior of the thermistor. So we're going to talk about that for just a second. <coughs> um, the Steinhardt Hart equation is the usual model that's used for a thermistor. There are three parameters, an A, B, and a C. So if you see these things in the data sheet, um, there's an equation that describes exactly how these work. And it's, you can look it up on Wikipedia, it's straightforward. Um, alternatively, uh, as, as, as an example, um, let's say you have a thermistor that's in a probe or I want to use this one for some specific reason, and I can't find a data sheet on this thing, right? So in my particular case, I'm working on a, uh, an automated smokehouse, and I want to be able to like, measure the temperature stuff as I'm cooking it and know what's going on. So I want like food grade, uh, probe, so I can't just go buy like a 10 cent thermistor off of mouse and that sort of stuff. So you can buy these probes, they sell them, you see like little digital meat thermometers and stuff. But I have no idea what, what thermistor is in here, right? Well, because there is a model for this and it's three parameters, I can basically measure the resistance at three known temperatures and I can generate exactly what's going on. So I can use any thermistor that you can measure, right? Two easy points to measure are ice water and boiling water, and you can just pick like room temperature in the middle or some other temperature that you have a good way of controlling and measuring and that sort of stuff. 
So uh, we talked about how this was like a very, very nonlinear sensor, right? So the question should be, what does the resistance and temperature look like? We're in this case going back to the standard example of the uh, 10 kilo ohm resistor at room temperature. So you can see um, it, it around zero degrees, and this is in Fahrenheit, zero degrees, uh, this thing will be about 85,000 ohms. And by the time you get up to boiling point, it's in the hundreds of ohms of resistance. A huge swing, very nonlinear uh, results in here, right? <coughs> So the next question, all right, wow, that's, that's like crazy, right? So if I put this in my voltage divider, what output voltage am I going to see, right? So we can grab that one, too. So we get this sort of like weird, again, nonlinear curve. Uh, you can see that like at zero degrees, uh, I'm graphing on the right axis with the red one. So at zero degrees, we're like reading less than one volt. And by boiling, we're almost up to five volts. So you can sort of see how we're reading in there. Sorry yes. to go back a little bit. The stat mark chart point you're speaking of, that model that uses the ADC, mm -hmm. that goes for all the resistors irrespective of what mm -hmm. ceramic or polymer. Yes, and in positive or negative coefficients, will, A will be either positive or negative. So yeah, and, and I, I thought I was like choking you guys with enough math, so I didn't actually fill the equation up there. I, I'm saying that's it. Decent equation, right? Is there like an online tool that does this? Uh, actually, uh, like the spreadsheet that I use to generate all this stuff, I'm going to clean it up and post it up with the presentation so you'll be able to do all of this stuff. Can you label your axes? <laughs> <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> Thanks. He didn't have to correct labels, though, so. <laughs> what, what's that? He didn't have to correct labels, so. <laughs> 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 uh, there you go. Uh, Bob, Sue, and Jim Bob, there we go, that's our, that's our three axes, right? So, so if that's what the voltage that I'm reading, uh, I, I can, you know, I'm gonna divide each one of those like into 1,024 steps. And <clears throat> so the, the last thing is gonna be like, where do I have the most accuracy, right? So this is a very nonlinear sensor. So like in some places, like one step is gonna be like one degree and another place, one step is gonna be like half a degree. The next thing is how do we incorporate the 4.9 uh, millivolt resolution? This one, again, I should label my axes or whatever. This is graphed on the right axis, not volts. This is actually um, <coughs> bits of resolution per degree Fahrenheit, right? So in this case, uh, higher means I have more accuracy, more resolution. So the standard example. <coughs> If, if I sort of like highlight the area where I have more than four bits per degree or basically like each step is about like a quarter of a degree Fahrenheit, you can see that like my peak area of accuracy is basically centered about 70 degrees, about room temperature, with about 50 degrees on each side. So you can have a pretty good accuracy measuring anything around room temperature. That is why they picked it and what happens and all that sort of stuff. So it's a really great, uh, I ended up, because I was using these things and had to figure out how to use them and what resistance I needed to put with it and all that sort of stuff. I ended up developing this tool and I thought it was pretty handy. I wanted to show it off and get you guys to sort of be familiar with like what's going on and to know which thermistor you want to use and what resistor you want to pair with that. <coughs> um, and in my case, uh, this is for this one specifically. Um, what I'm doing is I'm not measuring anything about room temperature. I'm measuring cooked food, right? So, and specifically, I'm interested in smoking food. So I really only want to cook things up to about 190 degrees Fahrenheit. And they, you know, this is basically, it is what it is. It's actually like 12 million ohms uh, at zero degrees, and it drops down to like less than 100,000 by the time I get up into the range that I'm interested in measuring. But in my case, you can see I picked uh, values that, that give me my peak accuracy between 110 and 220 degrees. What are, can you say what the <coughs> green, green... So, so green. The, the blue axis here, or the blue graph, is going to be like resistance as a function of temperature, right? Yeah. The red is going to be my output voltage, 
So one of the things that you, you, you can see here is that I'm not actually going all the way up to the So I'm actually like wasting part of my analog um, measurement range, right? So I'm never going to use all of the steps, all 1024 steps when I'm measuring here. But that's okay because as you can see in the green axis, I have almost, um, I'm getting almost like five to six um, steps per degree in the range that I'm interested in measuring. So if you use like a four volt A wrap, then you get more resolution at that point? Uh, yes, I could. I could. Um, and there, there are other tricks that you can play with that. I could externally power the thing so I'm not I'm using more than five volts. So did I understand you say correctly that you have five degrees per, per 1024 steps? Is that what you said? I have, I'm sorry? Did you say you have about five degrees per step or five degrees Fahrenheit per step? Uh, no, no, no. I have five five to six steps per degree Fahrenheit. Oh, okay. So, so it's like a fifth of a degree accuracy or a sixth right. of a degree accuracy. Right. And in, in this range, I'm sort of highlighting the area that's four and up. So that, right. that's kind of how I pick these. These are the smooth resistance. Right? As a function of as function of temperature, yes. So is there any uh, external circuitry that linearizes that that you, you know what I'm saying? Basically it almost looks like it's in the wall domain, right? Right, right, right. So is there any uh, circuitry that people use to convert from the log domain back to the linear domain? So that way you don't have to worry about this. You've basically done it in hardware, right? Mm -hmm. I I've not seen it. Okay. I maybe haven't done a whole lot of digging around with it, but I haven't seen it. <coughs> but, you know, if you're like a pro at analog circuitry, you can do all that stuff. Well, I've done a decent amount in the audio realm, and so the I'll audio just hear this. Yeah. <coughs> uh, so, as a recap for thermistors, right, pros and cons, thermistors are like very, very cheap. Uh, like, this sensor, all stainless braided with food grade stainless, you know, insertion probe and all that kind of stuff. It's like 12 bucks. Like the bare thermistors like we were looking at before are like 12 cents and they're like super cheap. Um, they work really well with Arduino. Like you can see the standard example, like it's set up super easy so you can measure a whole bunch of stuff around room temperature. Uh, these things have very good accuracy. We, we were talking like in these examples like five or six steps per, per degree Fahrenheit. So it's, it's really easy to get you know, very good accuracy with these things. And tons of commercial availability. Like you can buy this easy, right? Um, the cons to these things that unless you get them in like a probe like this, uh, like the ones with like the little glass beads, they're physically fragile. It's easy to break them. They have like super hair thin leads on them. Um, and the other problem is because they are like polymers and stuff, they have a very limited temperature range. Um, that's part of the reason, like, when you're doing 3D printing, and you're measuring the head temperature with a thermistor, like, if you overheat, not only can you, like, burn your filament, you can also, like, melt your thermistor. That sort of stuff. They, they cap out about 300 degrees C. Do you, um, I think we're using a 100K thermistor, so what happens if it does burn? Can you say that? Does it say it's... Uh, I don't, I don't really... I mean, I don't know what the, the failure mode is on those guys. What, what I'm saying is, like, it becomes like a, not a good measurement tool at like the higher ranges. Right. Like, maybe. It, it, I think they tend to fail open, and in that case, it would think it's like, way too hot and shut the power off. But that won't really help you if you're already up that high and you're melting or charring your filament. <coughs> Any questions about thermistors before we go on? <coughs> Anybody? No. Okay. Uh, so, the limited temperature range is like one of the cons, right? So, when you want to measure something that's hotter, and don't pay any attention to me as I turn on the uh, soldering iron, uh, the mixture will not work, right? Um, you need to use something else. We talked a little bit about RTDs before. You can use them. They are mostly platinum, sometimes copper. They're always going to be expensive, but they will have a much higher temperature range. They basically work exactly the same. The temperature change causes the resistance change. Oh, is, that a is that a thermal couple, or is that a separate thing? No, no, no. Uh, it is. It is a pure metal, right? Okay. So it's no dissimilar metals. It's going to be like pure copper or pure platinum or something else. Where we have done a lot of measurement and we know exactly how much the resistance changes as a function of temperature. 
Right. Uh, thermocouples are going to be your other alternatives. Like, if you actually dig into the Marlin firmware when you're doing 3D printing, you'll see that they're either set up to use a thermistor or a thermocouple. So it's going to be your, your um, high temperature access, right? So here's a picture of like what you can expect to see with thermocouples. Uh, the picture on the left has like a pretty standard plug. You'll see this plug. A lot of um, a lot of multimeters these days have plugs for these sort of things in there. So uh, other times you just get the bare wire for the braided cable. Uh, it's pretty, you know, get them in probes or just bare. Kind of you. you there's a lot of commercial availability here, so you can find whatever probe you need for whatever application. So, we talked before, like, thermistors are polymers that change uh, resistance based on temperature. Well, thermocouple is uh, an entirely different mechanism from that. Basically, when you put any two dissimilar conductors together, they produce a very small temperature-dependent voltage, right? And you may have seen this uh, in a lot of different ways. This, this has a lot of different names. Seebeck effect, Peltier effect, if you've seen like thermoelectric coolers, or Peltier coolers, or any of that sort of stuff. All using this sort of property, if we put dissimilar conductors together, uh, and at different temperatures, they produce different voltages. If we apply the voltage, they produce a temperature differential, that sort of stuff. So it's the same thing we're doing. Uh, this is sort of generically referred to as the thermoelectric. So uh, there are different commercial combinations. You know, some dissimilar metals don't produce much. Others produce quite a lot. Some dissimilar metals corrode. You may have heard of like galvanic corrosion and that sort of stuff. So there's like there's been a lot of research in history into deciding like what combinations that we're going to use. For most applications, the most common thing you're going to see is the Type K thermocouple. You may have bought a multimeter that comes with a Type K thermocouple and plug it right in and read it and that sort of stuff. Uh, it is made with uh, chromel and alumel, which are both nickel alloys. One has chromium, one has aluminum. Uh, these things are super cheap, and the number one point reason that you want to use this is the super wide temperature range. You can look at this thing, it's thousands of degrees Fahrenheit that you can measure with it. So, uh, in, in a case where you know, every other temperature measurement stuff that you're going to use is like melted, destroyed, charred, whatever, these things are still working fine. So if you want to do like kiln controls or something like that where I'm making glass and that sort of thing, you're going to end up using thermocouples. Type K is not going to get you all the way up to like melting steel and that sort of stuff, but they have like different types that go, that use refractory metals and whole nine yards and you can dip them in liquid steel to measure the temperature and stuff. They are really cool from that perspective. How much do you affect cave generally? What's the price range? Um, I, I bought one example here. Like This is just like a bare wire one that comes from Adafruit, and I think these things are like $5. And they're, they're, they're not as cheap as their misters because you've got some like fancy metals in here and all that sort of stuff. But they're still very, very cheap. So for the process, uh, it's actually so, so it gets a little tricky whenever you see like I've got this as a thermocouple and you see like you know one wire and like, two prongs and that sort of stuff. It gets a little trickier than that. You actually need like a hot junction and a cold junction like the Peltier cooler. You have a hot side and a cold side. You have the same sort of thing. Uh, what that means in this case is that like thermocouples are very like ambient temperature dependent. So you 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 have to be very careful with how you do that. Um, and, and as another downside, they are generally not very accurate. Where we were talking about like uh, several steps per degree uh, for a thermistor, like a thermocouple is going to be like plus or minus a few degrees Celsius. So uh, but whenever you think in terms of like the full scale accuracy, that's not really that bad when you're talking about I can measure over thousands of degrees, right? Um, and, and here's here's the other kicker, right? So while these things are a linear sensor, we talked about how thermistors are nonlinear. Uh, the output only changes by microvolts per degree temperature step, right? So the obvious question here is like microvolts. 
we talked already about how the Arduino measures in millivolts, right? How do, how do we, what's the, what's the deal here, right? Well, the reality is that like you cannot just plug a uh, thermocouple directly into an Arduino and expect to get any sort of temperature measurement whatsoever. But, uh, you know, and pointing out the stuff we talked about before, you can have like dozens of degrees of temperature in like every step, or hundreds of degrees of, of temperature change before you even see like one step from the input on the Arduino, right? And even if you did do that, plug it in, it's like, well, I'm really only concerned about temperature to the nearest hundred. There's all that cold junction compensation stuff where I talked about it being like ambient temperature specific and that sort of stuff. It's 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 really a mess, right? But there is a chip uh, that they sell at Adafruit. You can pick it up. It's like ten, fifteen dollars, something like that. Uh, it is specifically designed to read type K thermocouples. It actually has a 12-bit ADC on it. We talked all about ADCs before, so you know what all this stuff means, right? Eight, eight significant bits of accuracy over the over the course of the thing. It has built-in cold temperature junction, which means like the little Max chip actually has a thermistor built in to read ambient temperature, so it can correct for the temperature sensitivity and that sort of stuff. Uh, there's an existing Arduino library and a little breakout board in the whole nine yards, so you can buy the thing, plug them up, and click the go button, and now you can read like melty metal temperatures. So how fantastic is that, right? This is the reason that we love Arduino. Anything that you want to do, print objects, control kilns, whatever you want to do, it has the power to let you do that. Um, so I have an example. Uh, I've turned on the uh, soldering machine here, and I still don't have a better way to do this than to all have. So this is the um, Arduino uh, library for the um, thermocouple breakout board. And you guys can come up and take a look at this after the presentation. Uh, it's as simple as, um, if you're familiar, it uses the, uh, what is it, the like, SPI single parallel interface thing. You, you basically like hook up three wires and it passes data down the wires and that sort of thing. So, all I'm going to do is tell it, like, these, I'm going to tell it, you know, what, what those three pins are. It has options where I can, like, change the temperature outputs and that sort of stuff. Um, this is the function that it builds in. Like, this is, like, the standard example that comes with it. And I just read the temperature. This is probably the cost. I'm going to bring up with, like, $15 a day. So, we can load this up. So I've got this thing set up to where it'll read uh, about one sample per second. So you, you can see, like, it's bouncing around a couple of degrees here. We talked about, like, eight least significant bits of accuracy. In this case, that works out to about, uh, with about four degrees Fahrenheit. So this thing's going to be accurate, kind of, like, plus or minus four degrees Fahrenheit. So it's reading, you know, in this case, uh, there's maybe a little bit of an offset error, and I was holding it earlier. Like, as I hold on to it, the temperature will rise up a little bit. Apparently my hands are sweaty. They're about 95 degrees. I'm sorry, one other question. But you're holding the very end. Is it only measuring the temperature at the end there? Or yes. Uh, yes. It's, it's only at the end. So so these, in this case, like the Promel and the Alamel wire are jacketed in like fiberglass insulation all the way to the tip. And the tip is actually welded together. So it's that that junction of dissimilar metals that produces the voltage here. So we're just going to take uh, the soldering iron right out and hold it right up to the tip. And we should see. I'm doing it right. Hold it.
and you know, as a, a type kid, I don't know if this thing would be okay reading all the way up to the point of, I really don't want to hold on to this thing anymore. Right, right, right. Yeah, you're probably saying not that And as the tip heats up, you know, there's, there's no problems with this thing reading my super high temperature, so Let's say you are interested in doing your own uh, reflow sovereign oven and you want to do it with like a, a used push rubber or something. Obviously you can't just go in there and solder in the thermistor because it wouldn't let the solder just like everything else. But you can plug one of these guys in and read the temperature out of there, no problem. And as we take it away from here, You know, it's a very low mass sensor here, so I can already hold it in my hand to cool it back down. So it'll take like wild temperature swings very quickly, no problems. And it's as simple as like downloading a library and setting a couple of points together, and you can measure temperature up into the thousands of degree range. So pros and cons of thermocouples. The pro, the pro twice is like a wide thousands of degrees wide. That's why you want to use uh, thermocouple. Uh, they're cheap, right? I mean, like, for five bucks, you can measure, like, uh, what's going on, like, inside a firebox or something. If you want to measure, like, what's the combustion temperature of blah, blah, blah. Drop it right in there, right? Um, the, the cons that when you're using this for Arduino, you do require some sort of breakout board that will do the cold temperature and amplify and do all the stuff that you need to do because you can't just plug it right in. And the other con is like the moderate accuracy. If, you, if you're really concerned about tight temperature controls uh, at a higher temperature, it's going to be tough. You can't really use this for that. I don't know off the top of my head, no. Um, but we can talk about that in a second. That is the end of the presentation. Hopefully, I haven't bored you to tears. Questions?
tear apart. Practically speaking, the element of the cost of interest is not going to answer my question. How do I do that? Well, I mean, we can dig into the specifics of your part of the problem, but as soon as we wrap up the general question, we can dig into the benefit of the U.S. No, I guess I was thinking, if someone were just saying, it didn't necessarily know the mechanics of the whole group of people who works. Oh, I got you. So we're going to have like a meta conversation about that. It's called nerd style. Yeah. Nerd style. Yeah. Where? In case you need a little more. Nerd style. Smell something out, which is interesting to a technical way around the team, and then they get caught in it, and they have to do it. Nerd style. You might do it for you. So, to, to answer that question in general, like, you can know, always ask questions on the little group, and man, there is no shortage of crazy ideas that will come out of that. <laughs> uh, we, we've just instituted the, the, new, uh, the new show and tell thing where, hey, I'm working on this, and I have problems and questions, and is there anybody that can help me? There's tons of ways to, uh, to get involved.